Good morning, everybody. Welcome to podcast number five. So I'm coming to you this morning from the wee small hours. I think it's about 4.30 in the morning. I'm on a little bit of a writer's retreat. Let's just say I needed a getaway. So I came to a place in Ohio, not real far from where I reside. And uh, it's called Geneva on the Lake, Ohio's best kept secret. I can walk by the lake. I can go to wineries, have fancy lunches, and retreat to my room where I'm writing music and updating my podcasts. Okay, so it's been a minute. I'm going to jump right in. Today I thought I would go into a little more detail about my life's journey with alopecia because that's also part of my story that I discuss in my book, Grateful, Faith Healing and the Gift of Music. It's also something for which I advocate, so... Let me begin by telling you there are four different types of alopecia. There's androgenetic alopecia, which is a severe thinning of the hair, where you can see hair, but you see the scalp underneath. There's alopecia areata, where you lose patches of hair that will sometimes return on its own. Other times it requires treatment. There's alopecia totalis, which is the total loss of hair all over your head only. And then there's alopecia universalis which is a complete and total loss of hair all over your head and body. So I've lived with some form of alopecia since the second grade. At that age, I began losing patches of hair, alopecia areata. And I would try, even as a little girl, obsessively trying to cover up those ball patches so that my classmates would not see, you know, kids can be a little cruel. They might make fun. Well, they did see, (laughs) and they did make fun. And that costs a lot of insecurity. So this hereditary autoimmune disease is usually triggered by stress. Now at that time, my teacher died unexpectedly. And this confused and burdened me as well as my classmates. Most of us had never experienced death and the sudden absence of someone we knew closely in our lives. And I can still remember that day in detail. Our principal, Mr. Coyne, came into our classroom and told us that our teacher, Mrs. Ellsholes, had passed away suddenly. His voice was soft and compassionate as he gave us the news. The calming effect of his voice didn't help though. The entire class began to cry. We suddenly found ourselves adjusting to life on life's terms. Kind of a tough lesson for youngsters. We were now living with the loss of our teacher and getting used to a new substitute whom we did not know. And she came in mid-year. It was a lot for second graders to take in. So the stress manifested in me with the onset of alopecia areata, as well as some tearful nights. Lucky for me, it was treatable at the time. And the successful treatment was the application of cortisone cream. With that, the hair grew back. However, bald patches returned throughout my younger years, each time growing a little bit bigger. The treatment became more painful. By the time I was in high school, the disease was more severe and required shots of cortisone in my head. They were painful, but they worked. The hair grew back, but not before increasing stress and insecurity as I continued to try to cover them up with my existing hair. I can remember days at my sales job with a mobile phone company back in the early 90s. I used to go inside the bathroom for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes at a time. I would try to cover all those bald patches up. I would turn and look at myself in the mirror in different angles, hoping that they wouldn't be uncovered. I would shake my head, (laughs) move it around, and hope that the hair didn't suddenly uh, show those bald patches underneath. So they became so big at this point, it was not always possible to cover them up. And people noticed and it further chipped away at my self-esteem. Then it got even worse. At age 26, I was dressing for a New Year's Eve performance. My sister was helping me to do my hair and she noticed six small bald patches right at the crown of my head. They eventually grew into one large spot and the shots no longer worked. I instead covered it with a fall, a fall you kind of comb into your hair at the top and then it mixes with the hair that was left. 
Boy, was that a pain to put on every day. A few weeks later, my hair was tremendously thin and I got a new kind of wig where it fit over my entire head and it had kind of a wefting underneath and I would literally go in with a crochet, one of those long crochet needles, and I would pull the few strands of hair that I had left through the wig and it would kind of integrate. And that was even a bigger pain. So we found ourselves back at the Cleveland Clinic and this time to see an endocrinologist. And he looked at me and he said, in a beautiful, thick Indian accent, you know, Maria, you are not losing all of your hair. So get this out of your mind. It's going to come back. So I left there feeling cautiously confident. But two weeks later, I returned. And I only had a few strands left. Well, he looked at me and he said, yes, Maria, you're losing all of your hair. (laughs) Well, I sarcastically responded, really? Do you think? (laughs) Really, you went to school for that? (laughs) I guess if it wasn't so uh, tearful at the time, it would have been funny. But I found myself, of course, needing a full wig and coming to this concession because now that all of my hair was gone on the top of my head, so was the rest of my body, my eyelashes, my eyebrows, leg hair, arm hair, nose hair, I mean, everything gone. I now had alopecia universalis, complete and total loss of hair all over my body and head. So coming to terms with this was a difficult journey, but the moment I put my first full wig on, the stress diminished tremendously. I mean, they didn't look like wigs. So what also helped to keep it in perspective was my actual experience walking into that wig store for the first time. And I'll never forget it. I was with my mom and my sister. My family was so supportive throughout the whole thing, but especially my mom and my sister, right? The only two other women in the family. While we were there looking for something that I would feel comfortable in, something that would look natural, in walked another young woman who also had alopecia universalis. She had lost all of her hair and she too was with her mom and her sister. I couldn't help but notice the parallels. She also had a double malady. She had alopecia and multiple sclerosis, the latter of which had her on disability and her body just did not move well. Her sister, like mine, was visibly upset to watch her only sister struggle with so much. Now, bipolar disorder is brutal, but I was much more controlled at this point. My life was getting back on track where that was concerned. I cannot imagine what it must have been like for this young woman to live with MS. So I found a wig that I really liked. And when my mom and my sister left and got in the car, we just looked at each other, commenting on this slightly parallel situation that we just witnessed, hers being much worse. Both that young woman and I were facing a kind of a milestone in our lives, wearing wigs for the first time, coming to the concession that our hair was gone. And it was one to which we did not look forward. And we both went through it with our mother and our sister, our only sister. It was parallel except for that realization that her situation was truly something more difficult than mine. My mother turned to me in the car and she said, someone always has it worse, Maria. Just thank God, honey, because you're blessed. And mom was right. Losing my hair was traumatic at first. I mean, I literally sat at home and I ran my fingers through my hair and I would just pull out clumps and I laid it on this long white pillow that I had on my lap. There was my thick, black, curly, coarse hair all spread across this white pillow. But as my life with bipolar disorder, I learned that God turns trials and traumas into testimonies. This is where my advocacy, excuse me, my advocacy journey does not stop with those afflicted with bipolar disorder. It also extends to the alopecians of the world. We are immunocompromised, but whether we wear a wig or we don't wear a wig, Our disease is not life-threatening, so there's nothing to fear. After all, it's only hair. So I'm going to leave you today with a song that I covered 
a favorite of mine growing up by the Beach Boys. I don't have to tell you that alopecia also had me isolating growing up. There were hours that I spent alone in my room, sometimes listening to music, sometimes singing songs, sometimes writing in my journal or practicing my flute. And there were times that I just sat on my bed and cried. I didn't understand a lot of what I was going through, so I isolated. And this is a kind of way I put that into song. It's from my fifth album called Here Comes Winter. This is my rendition of the Beach Boys in my room. I'm alone, but I 